Acts 13. We're going to be in the last um, section of verses in this uh, chapter that we've been in for a while now. And uh, um, can I be uh, can I be direct with you? I know it's a little out of character for me, but uh, can I be direct with you? Um, the main point of, of friction that you may have as an individual, the main point of friction that you have as a Christian with things like personal growth and feeling content and, and being at peace, and I'm not talking about just you, but like all Christians, all believers in general struggling with this, the main point of friction in getting these things, having these things happening in your life is that you don't read the Bible. The last time most of you, or many of you perhaps, engaged with the Bible in any way was the last time that you were here, the last time you tuned into the live stream, the last time you came to the building. And the Gospel Coalition article this, this past week cited the Canadian Bible Engagement Survey. I was done by the Bible League here in Canada. And there's a link in, in the notes for both the article and, and the survey. And this survey revealed that only one in seven Canadian Christians, one in seven, that's 14% of Canadian Christians, read the Bible at least once per week. And the survey included sermons in that, hearing a sermon in that. Most Canadian Christians read the Bible seldom or never. Now, in this week's passage, this section from Acts 13 that we're going to see, the synagogue attendees, so first of all, we've been looking at it for several weeks. There was a setup with Paul and Barnabas traveling on their first missionary journey. They come to this city, Antioch and Pisidia. They go to the synagogue, and we've heard two messages just on the sermon itself that Paul was invited uh, to preach. And in this week's passage, the synagogue attendees who had been listening to Paul preach this message, they now respond. And in verse 42, we're going to read this in a moment, the whole section in a, in a moment, the people begged that these things might be told them again. They couldn't get enough of the gospel. The hearing of God's word uh, charged, uh, charged them up and started the process of changing everything for them and for many other people in that city and in that region. And many of you have started out this year wanting things to be different. It's natural for us when we start a new year to go, you know, I want this to be different. And 14 days in, some of you have already given up. You made resolutions, you had ideas, you made a list. It was things you wanted to accomplish this year, changes you wanted to make, and, and already you failed at it and given up entirely, and you're going to repeat the cycle at the end of this year going into the next one. You want this year to be different. You want change. It's not too late. Start today on the 14th day of this new year. You want to be closer to Christ. Some of you want to overcome sin. Some of you want to resolve some relational conflict that's going on in your life. Some of you just want to have more peace in the midst of the chaos of your life. And I'm going to tell you right now, based on what we've already talked about and what we're going to see in the passage, that it's, it's right here. All of the things that you want to accomplish, everything you want to build into your life, all the change that you hope to have, is right here in God's Word. Now let me read the passage, and then we're going to work through it verse by verse as we always do. This is Acts 13, 42 to the end of the chapter. As they went out, the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you. Since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles." 
For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city, stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Now listen, when the word of God is preached, what, what kind of response should be flowing out of the life of a genuine Christian? When the word of God is preached, first of all, I want more. When I hear the word preached, I want more. So again, we looked at the last two, the two last messages that we had in this series were the sermon itself. And as that sermon in verses 16 through 41 ended, you know, the synagogue service was coming to an end. They said, you are loved at the end of the service. And in verse 42, as people were leaving, they begged that these things might be preached to them the next Sabbath. They wanted to hear more. And there were, in fact, two very distinct responses to the preaching of God's word. And the first one we see here, verse 43, after the meeting, many of the Jews and some of the devout Gentile converts, these Gentile converts to Judaism, followed Paul and Barnabas. And Paul and Barnabas, seeing them and conversing back and forth with them, urged these folks to continue in the grace of God. In other words, just live out the things that you've just heard me preach. Start to live those things out in your life. Then fast forward seven days the next week, verse 44, the next Sabbath, Almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. Now, why? The reason why this massive crowd now gathers a week later is because the grace of God that Paul and Barnabas spoke of was already being experienced because the Bible was being preached and because people were spreading the word about it. And we're going to come back to that thought in a few moments. Having tasted it, they want it more. I remember this, this phrase has stuck with me for, I don't know, 15, 16 years. I don't know how long it was, but I went to a conference many, many years ago, and I heard a conference speaker say this particular line. He said this, do not taste what you do not want to hunger after. Do not taste what you do not want to hunger after. You can see why that stuck with me. He, he was talking about it, of course, in the context of temptation and sin. So if you don't want to be addicted to something, you don't want to sin with regard to some particular sin issue, one temptation that you might have, then don't taste it, okay? If you think you have a propensity to, to go in a certain direction with a certain sin, don't go near it. Don't taste it. Don't try it. Don't put the taste in your mouth for it. Don't try the things that you don't want to be addicted to. And it makes sense that perhaps the opposite of that is also true, Taste the thing that you do want to hunger after. Taste the thing that will fill you and satisfy you. And once you've tasted it, you're going to go, you know what? I want more of that. I want more of that. The thing that will bring me enjoyment, the thing that will bring me peace, the thing that will help me to live a, a satisfying, God-glorifying life. I want to taste the thing that I want to hunger after. Uh, people who know me know that um, I love honey. I love honey. I love it so much. People who know me will buy it for me as gifts. I will get honey from all over the world will be brought to me and given to me, and I will eat it <laughs> because I love it. I love it in my tea. I love it in my coffee. I put it on toast. I love honey. Winnie the Pooh and I, <laughs> you know that episode where he gets stuck in the tree? I'm afraid that might happen to me someday. <laughs> I love honey. Um, and, 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 and I want to tell you that I'm, I'm just obeying the scriptures in that love of honey. <laughs> Prove it to me, Todd. Okay, I will. 
Psalm 19, verses 7 through 11. I've just kind of, I've edited it up a little bit here, but speaking of the word of God, look what it says. The law, the testimony, the commandments, the precepts, the rules of the Lord are sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. I'm just trying to be obedient to the Lord here. I love honey. Because once you've tasted honey, you just go, this is the best way to sweeten anything. And, and once you've tasted the word of God, if you respond as these folks have, have responded, you're going to find it so sweet that you keep going back to it. And you want it more and more. And I'm going to tell you, if you're a professing Christian, you, you say you're a believer, you, you've made some commitment to, to Christ, and, and you have no desire for the word, like as in, as in what I'm saying right now doesn't even make sense to you, then I would be concerned for you. And you should be concerned for yourself that you have no appetite for this, that you have no taste for the word of God in this way. You should be hungering after it. You should want it more and more. You should have a deep abiding desire for the word of God. And I'm encouraged Having put that challenge in front of you, I'm encouraged that so many of you do have this because I believe that the survey numbers I shared in the, in the introduction are not necessarily reflective of this church. Many of you do read your Bibles regularly. You look into it. You mark it up. You study it. You make notes. You review it again after you've heard it preached. You're keeping journals. You, you're in a life group where this is being studied and discussed again, and you dig in even deeper to the Word. You're reading the Bible daily on your own. You've made it a habit. It's a spiritual discipline, and you are, in the very best sense of this, continuing in the grace of God. But some of you are sitting here going, that is not me, and I need to up my game. And the simplest way to do that is to start reading the Bible. Just read it. Just get it open. Get a version that is plain to you, that makes sense, and, and, and read it. If, if it's helpful to use a Bible reading plan, get a Bible reading plan. We put some uh, links in the notes for several uh, Bible reading plans that you can use. that will get you through the Bible it, 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 along certain themes, a different way of reading it chronologically or thematically or back and forth between the Old and New Testaments to just keep you on track. All of them helpful as long as you're just getting into God's Word. I'm currently, I got my Bible a, a few years ago. I haven't yet read through the entirety of this particular Bible that I own, so that's what I'm doing right now. I'm working through all of it. And, and when I finish one book, I go back to the table of contents, mark that, I've read that one, I'm gonna go to another one. And I'm, but I'm reading with a pen, which means I read slowly. It means I'm marking things, I'm putting notes in the margins, I'm thinking of cross-references, I'm circling words, I'm highlighting stuff. I'm, I'm taking it slowly. Right now I'm in John's Gospel, and, and it's gonna take me days to get through just chapter one. So I'm in no hurry, I'm on no schedule, I'm just reading the Bible, and I'm reading it for depth of understanding. But there are some people in our church right now um, who, are, who are on a different reading program, the exact opposite, really, of what I'm doing. In, in fact, how many people have ever done a schedule where you read through the Bible in a year? How many people have ever done that? Read through the Bible in a year. If you want to read through the Bible in a year, there's all kinds of plans that will take you through that, about four chapters a day, that's all it takes. And you'll read through the Bible in a year. There are some folks in our church who are doing something called the Bible Shred. And they are reading the Bible all of it in one month, right? That's what I said. <laughs> one month, it's about 40 chapters a day that they're reading. Now, they're not reading it with a pen, that's for sure. They're just reading it, and they're reading it to get the big picture, the whole story all at once in one month. And I love that. And whatever would work for you, the, the bottom line here is that if you're a Christian, you should have a desire for it, and the, and the way to get that desire is just to start reading it. Here's the second one. When the Word of God is preached, I also see opposition to it. So not everybody's happy about it. Not everybody's happy about the reading of God's Word. And I said there were two responses to Paul's sermon. On that next Sabbath, verse 45, when the Jews saw the crowds, 
when they saw all these people who were so excited about the word of God, notice what it says, they were filled with jealousy, they began to contradict what Paul was saying, and they started slandering him, maligning him, reviling him personally. Now, there's a lot in that. When you, when you, to, to analyze what's going on here, the, the, the religious establishment is unhappy about what's happening with all of these Gentiles getting excited about the Word of God. The establishment doesn't like change. And when we're talking specifically here about those who have been entrusted with the message of God, with the gospel, and with the mission that God has given to us in this world, the reality is that God is going to move on from us He's going to move on from those who ignore, minimize, distort, or reject his word, even if they identify as his people. We're his people, but we're not excited that these people are excited about his word. That's because they don't want the change. They don't want to give control and power over. And this is happening, this this isn't just like a first century Asia Minor problem. This is a today problem. Um, I spoke with a man who's been in our church a very long time. He and I a month ago spent some time together, and he uh, he said to me that uh, uh, he and his wife decided that uh, one Sunday they were just going to go to the uh, local church. It was an established one of the more historic denominations in Canada, is what I'll say, and they were just going to visit that church on this particular Sunday, and so they. Uh, went uh, to the service, and after the service, the pastor was at the door greeting people and uh, noticed that they were visitors. And uh, he, he noticed this man and his wife, and he noticed that this man was carrying his Bible, had carried his Bible to church, as he does when he comes here. And the pastor said to him, the pastor of a Christian church at the end of a service to guests, one of whom is carrying a Bible, He said, well, if you come back again, you won't be needing that, as he pointed to the Bible, because we don't use the Bible much here. Now, so-called progressives in these traditional denominations have so minimized the Word of God and are patting themselves on the back for doing that but are actually overseeing the demise of their own denominations. So this denomination is in, I I checked some studies, some stats on this particular denomination, um, but it's representative of several. This denomination is in steep decline, closing and selling off churches, a lack of uh, clergy in their seminaries to fill uh, the pulpits, a declining membership, declining attendance, budget deficits, And projections say that by 2040, this denomination will cease to exist altogether. Is anyone surprised? You see the correlation? You abandon the word of God and God says, fine, if that's the way you want it, you have now become irrelevant. And so this opposition is there. How are we going to respond to that happening even in our own day? Verse 46, Paul and Barnabas, for their part, they don't shrink back in the face of the opposition. But they speak out boldly saying, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you. And he's talking to the Jewish leaders. He said, it was necessary. You, you, you're the ones through whom the Messiah came. You're the ones who have had the word of God, the Hebrew scriptures, that pointed to this Messiah that is the hope of the world. So it was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you. But since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, we're going to turn to the Gentiles because they seem very excited about it. And he says in verse 47, the Lord gave us a mission. And he's not just saying this as his own opinion, but he quotes Isaiah 49, 6 here, which made it clear that the Jews were to be a conduit of the gospel. A conduit to the whole, the whole world was supposed to know the gospel because of Israel. But Israel failed at that. 
And, and here's the quote from Isaiah 49, 6, which we see in verse 47 here. He says, I have made you, Israel, I have made you a light to the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. But they didn't shine that light. Remember Jonah? Jonah was representative of the whole nation. God wanted to send Jonah to Nineveh to, Nineveh, to preach to these pagans, these Gentiles. And, and, and Jonah was like, I don't want to do that. And at the end of the day, the reason, the main reason why Jonah didn't want to do that was he was afraid that God would actually be merciful to them and save them. And he didn't want to see that happen. He just wanted his nice, little, little neat little Israel thing. This is ours. And the entire nation was like that. They should have been thrilled. Jonah should have been thrilled that the Ninevites repented. These, these synagogue leaders should have been thrilled that there was a massive crowd the second Sabbath to hear the word of God preached and to see their eagerness for the word. This whole incident led to what John Paul Hill calls a decisive turning point for the mission. The Jewish leaders and their followers had rejected the gospel that in fact embraces all people without distinction. And later in chapter 18 of Acts, Paul makes the final break with this strategy to bring the gospel to the Jews first. And he says in chapter 18, verse 6, from now on I will go to the Gentiles because the Jews simply wouldn't relent in persecuting him and maligning him for his preaching. And that's what's happening here. Look at verses 50 and 51. The Jews uh, incited others in the city who stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, drove them out of their district. And verse 51 says, Paul and Barnabas shook the dust off their feet. Uh, to show their opposition to them and their rejection of the gospel. And they went on to a different city, to Iconium. What's interesting in chapter 14 is after they had done their ministry in Pisidia, they had to come back through Antioch of Pisidia and back down to the coast. And they stopped in and they encouraged the believers. Uh, chapter 14, verses 21 and 22 tell us that. And this has to be our response as well to anybody who's going to say to us, you know what, like I'm going to get into God's word even more and, I, and, and, and people around you are going to say, there's going to be people around you, even some who call themselves Christians who are going to go, well, that's really, you don't need that much Bible. It's myths. It, it's just people made it up. It's not whatever they're going to say about it, whatever, whatever point of opposition they have to cast doubt in your mind. Our response has to be the boldness, the same boldness that Paul and Barnabas show here. And in fact, when facing opposition to sharing the gospel, I would just offer you these three little tips, okay? Facing opposition to sharing the gospel, do what Paul and Barnabas did. Accept it as a natural consequence of the proclamation of the gospel. Secondly, shake it off. And third, keep preaching. Stay with the word. All right, here's a third response. It's worship. When I hear the word of God preached, it compels me to worship. Now, Paul's quoting of Isaiah 49 to the Jews who were opposing him ends up being a massive blessing to the Gentiles who are eager for the word and who hear the conversation. They're responding to the word. And, and what Israel had been given was always intended for the whole world. And the Gentiles are finally hearing that. Verse 48, when the Gentiles heard this, that the gospel was always intended for them, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. These Gentiles were saved. Their sins were forgiven. The, the chasm that existed between Israel's God, Yahweh, and these Gentile sinners has now been bridged. Unbelief is, is turned into faith, death into eternal life. Those who are once for themselves or who worship these pagan small g gods were now worshiping and glorifying Jesus Christ. And all of it, the result of simply preaching God's word. The preaching of God's word made them into worshipers. 
And that's important for us to hear. You know, we have, we're a, you know in, in Christendom, we're, we're a low church. We, we, we're a low church, which means that we're very simple, we're very casual, we don't have a lot of what you would call liturgy. We don't have a lot of forms or rituals or set prayers that we, what, that we say. We're, we're non-denominational. We're not tied into any denomination. So things, we'll just say we're, it's very simple. We're a Bible church. That's what we say. We're just a Bible church. And our main liturgy, even though we, we do practice the Lord's table and we practice baptism according to the scriptures, we do these two ordinances that the Lord has uh, commanded us to do. We do pray in the midst. That's a spiritual discipline. It's a point of liturgy as well. But the main liturgy that we do is worship in the word. Every week when we get together, we sing songs of worship to the Lord, and then we have a substantive time in God's word, and then we sing again, and we go on our way. It's, it's worship and the word. That's our, we would just say, that's our liturgy. The worship, here's why we do it this way. The worship prepares our hearts to hear the word. And the word compels us back to worship. The word prepares our hearts. The worship prepares our hearts for the word and the word compels us back to worship. And that isn't just this weekly gathering of 75, 80 minutes, we're here together and we do this together. It's far more than the weekly gathered expression of worship that's in view here because after all these new believers were not in a worship service. They were walking along the way with Paul and Barnabas. They're just hearing teaching and they're having conversation. They were now living a life of worship. And it's something that Paul would later explain in greater detail to the Roman believers and, and, and to us as a consequence. In Romans 12, 1, he said, I appeal to you, brothers, uh, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. In other words, Christian, the normal Christian life is you take the whole life, your, the, the totality of your life, and you place all of that on the altar, and all of it is offered to God, not just 75 minutes a week. All of it is pre presented to God as a living sacrifice. And he says, this is in fact your spiritual worship. In other words, worship for us is 24-7. It's holistic. It's all, every part of our lives. I saw this A.W. Tozer quote, and I was too late to include it in the slides, but I posted it on my socials. Um, and listen to this. If you do not worship God seven days a week, you do not worship him on one day a week. If you do not worship God seven days a week, you do not worship God one day a week. There is no such thing as, a, as Sunday worship unless it is accompanied by continual daily worship. That's A.W. Tozer. Again, it's holistic. It's 24-7. It's, 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 the, it's the fullness of my life attributing worth to Christ. It's the transformation of every part of who I am to be conformed to who Christ is. And Paul actually says that in the very next verse, Romans 12, 2, he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And the renewal of your mind happens when you get into the word. There's no other way to renew your mind. There's no other way to replace the lies that the world has told you unless you insert the truths of God's word into your mind. That's the transformation that God wants to do in our lives. The renewal of your mind happens when you get into his word. All right, here's another. When I hear the preaching of God's word, I want others to hear it too. The first Sabbath gathering was at the synagogue. It was likely a very modest gathering. The synagogue wouldn't have been that large. The second was almost the whole city gathered. And so those who had heard Paul and Barnabas on that first Sabbath, they obviously spread the word about the word. They spread the word about the word. They did it in seven days around a whole city and a whole region. There was no social media to help them. There were no phones, no texting, no TV, no radio, no, no newspapers. You remember what those were? Remember when we had the newspapers? You put a little ad in there, speaker in town, meeting at the plaza. 
Okay, little, don't even have that. It was word of mouth and thousands of people came. And the word of God does that to a person. Over and over again, we see this very thing happening where one person hears the word and wants to tell another person about it. John chapter 1, we have um, Philip and Nathaniel. And, and Philip goes to Nathaniel and he said, because he had heard Jesus, and he says, We've found him. We found him. Of whom Moses and the prophets, uh, Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. We found him. The one that's written about in the word. A few chapters later, the woman at the well, she has this conversation with Jesus and he shares with her the word of God, the gospel. And she heard it and she ran back into the village and she told everyone, come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? I mean, we're 13 chapters into the book of Acts and what have we seen so far? At the preaching of God's word, 3,000 were converted and baptized on the day of Pentecost. Stephen preached a sermon that led to his own martyrdom, but also to the conversion of the Apostle Paul. The Ethiopian was sitting in his chariot on his way away from Jerusalem back home, and he was reading Isaiah the prophet in his chariot, and God sent Philip along to explain what he was reading. Cornelius was at home and received a vision, a word from God, this Roman centurion who then converted to Christianity, gave his life to God as Peter brought the gospel to him. And then in the first missionary journey, the first chapter of what we're seeing in this current journey, Paul and Barnabas preached in Cyprus and many heard the gospel and responded. Every time the word was proclaimed, preached, taught, and shared, change happened. And those people wanted other people to know. The result in this case, verse 49, was that the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. It didn't stay just in Antioch, but it spread all around Pisidia. You can imagine people had come to town maybe on that first Sabbath and had heard a little word about it, or they had been in the market that week, and people were talking about it in the market and at the gates. And they went back to their villages and their towns and their rural areas and they shared it with their families and their friends and their colleagues and they said, you got to come next Sabbath. Because everybody who heard it wanted someone else to know about it. Everywhere it goes, the word has its effect. And its effect is either drawing sinners to Christ or repelling them away. And this is our mission. This is our mission as Christians today. This is our mission as a church. This is why we want to plant in Alliston. We realize that we're kind of capped at the amount of people that we can have in this facility, so let's start some churches around the county. Let's get more people to hear it. We can't fit more in here maybe, but we can fit more in in other places. Maybe people who would never drive to Barrie, but they'll go to a church in Alliston. Let's go to Alliston. Let's go to Innisfil. Let's go to Aurelia. Let's go to Midland and Penetanguishene and Collingwood and Wasega Beach. Let's plant churches all around Simcoe County. Let's take the gospel out to our own county. Because others want to hear this too. This is our mission to get the word out there, to tell those who don't know about the gospel, about the glory of Jesus Christ. The content of our preaching, what people need to hear, it's not progressivism. It's, it's, not, it's not the latest philosophy. It's not therapeutic. It's not, we're not preaching self-help. We're not preaching wise maxims for, for right living. We're not preaching feel-good religion. We preach, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians, we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. That's what we preach. Our focus is Jesus Christ. Our foundation is Jesus Christ. Our message is Jesus Christ. He is the, the promise of God fulfilled. We preach his death, his burial, his resurrection. We preach that he alone is the light of the world. 
and that he is the only way for sins to be forgiven, the only way for us to be justified, for God to declare us to be righteous in the sight of God. He is the only one who can give us hope of eternity with God. And when we hear it, we want others to hear it too. And that's the mission he gave us. The Great Commission in Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Teaching them. The thing that transformed your life, teach them. Tell them about that. And finally this, when the word of God is preached, I'm filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. This uh, describes all involved. This should describe you and me as we hear the word of God. It describes Paul and Barnabas in the, in the context. It describes the new converts who are so excited about the word. It says simply in verse 52, as a blanket statement, the disciples, all, all those who were Christians, were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. And the word does that. If you're, if you're chasing joy and happiness, I mean, who, who doesn't want to be happier? I want to be happier. I'm sure you want to be happier. You want more joy in your heart? Who doesn't want more of that in this year? Who doesn't want more peace, more satisfaction, more fulfillment? Who doesn't want more hope in their life? And if you do, then please hear what I'm saying in this message, what this passage is saying to us. Simply reading the Bible is life-changing. The article I cited in the introduction also pointed to a survey that LifeWay Research posted that said this, if, if, if we engage with the Bible four times a week, there are certain benefits. If we engage with the Bible four times per week, the study pointed out that if you engage with the Bible once a week, that's fine. If you engage with it twice a week, there might be a marginal little benefit to you. Three times, maybe a little bit more. But that there was a sharp increase, a spike in the graph if you engaged with the Word of God four times times a week, more than half of the week. And so here, here's, here's what the study showed. When you engage with the Bible four times per week, feeling lonely drops 30%. A lot of lonely people today, staring at their phones, even in families, even if you're with somebody, just scrolling through reels, looking at socials, a lot of lonely people. There's a lot of lonely people in this room right now. We're in a room full of people, 300 plus people here, and there's lonely people right here. We read the Bible, we'll feel lonely. That'll drop by 30%. Anger issues drop 32%. Imagine how that would bless your home. If you just start getting into the Bible more and anger starts to drop in your home. I mean, that can't help but help, but, but make your home a better place to live. It's going to help your marriage. It's going to help your child rearing. Third, bitterness in relationships drops 40%. Again, that's, that's marriage. That's a, that's a marriage benefit right there, isn't it? Isn't it? Alcoholism drops 57%. Sex outside of marriage drops 60%. 8%. Feeling spiritually stagnant drops 60%. Viewing pornography drops 61%. If you read the Bible four times a week. And then on the, on the positive side, if you read the Bible four times a week, sharing your faith jumps 200%. You want to share it. And discipling others jumps 230%. The study was done by the Center of Bible Engagement, and it, it, all, it all seems so simple, doesn't it? See, I told you we shouldn't have gone up and gone to church today. I mean, it's, uh, it's, all he told us today is to read the Bible. 
It's so cold out. We came to church and he just told us to read the Bible. A pastor told us to read the Bible. What else was he going to say? We could have stayed home. It's so simple. And I get, I get the objection. Can't be that simple, can it? Yet study after study shows there's actually a correlation. Even studies that are not done by Christian organizations, there's been studies done by universities who have looked at this very thing and say there is a benefit. And if you're skeptical, I get it. If, if you're watching or you're here in the room and you're skeptical, I don't think, it, I don't think it's going to work. I don't think it's going to work. I would just say this. I, I, just, I would just ask one thing. I would just ask you to try it. Just try it. There's no, there's no downside, is there? If you just said, okay, like I haven't tried it before. Well, just try it this week. Just read, pick four days out of the next seven and read a chapter of the Bible, you know, whatever you want to do. Find a reading plan. Just read it a few days this week. Just try it. Is there no downside? It's not going to hurt you. Even if you're a skeptic, just give it a try. There's no downside to committing to the regular reading of God's Word. And I want to slip in one other reference here. If you're like, I'm convinced of this, I already get it, or maybe I need a little bit more uh, convincing on all of this. I, I read a great book uh, yesterday. It's a short book by Kevin DeYoung. It's called Taking God at His Word. It's a very quick read, and, um, and it, it just reinforces everything that we've talked about here uh, today, but in far more detail. And, um, and that, I know that would be a blessing to you for extra study on this particular topic. And I want to come back, just as we close this, I, I want to come back to that psalm that um, I cited earlier, but just really quickly, and, and not all of it, but Psalm 19, and I want to read these verses as a way to close off this time, and, and I'm going to pray, and then we're going to worship to close off our service together, but just set, set aside everything that's in your hands right now, and, and just even close your eyes, because this is a prayer. Let me pray uh, this psalm over us. This is Psalm 19, verses uh, 7 through 14. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And Father, we pray that your spirit would continue to do a work in each of our lives, to give us a, a, a desire, a taste, a hunger for the word of God in our lives. Grow that in each one of us. I pray that, that commitments would be made in this room right now and those who are watching, Father, to, to increase the amount of time that's being spent in the Word. For those who have never done it, to start. For those who are doing it, to increase it. To hunger and thirst for righteousness, as you said in the Beatitudes. When we do that, we're blessed and we'll be filled. So God, fill us with your Word. We pray now in Christ's name.